Alright, we're going to be doing something a little silly today. My name is Witty G, and today we're going to be talking about the 2000s horror comedy movie classic, Killjoy. Come alive, Killjoy, come alive. A movie that teaches us the old age lesson that no matter how hard you've been bullied, how sad your backstory is, or if you call upon the power of the dark arts, if a person isn't interested in you romantically, there's nothing you can do about it. Go find a different romantic interest. Also, don't aggravate thugs and hit on their girlfriends. That's also a big theme of this movie. But the Stephen King inspired film takes a much goofier perspective on the evil clown killing people trope. And we gotta thank Killjoy the Clown for bringing that to the table. <laughs> Maybe you should ask your homeboys. A curly haired specter freak show that continually haunts these poor victims in the same goddamn warehouse every single time. So I really hope you like this set. The movie was directed by Craig Ross Jr. and written by Carl Washington, who also cameos at the end of the movie. Other actors include Kareem Grimes, playing the role of the protagonist Michael, the nerd who just won't learn his lesson, which is to be content with their role within the social status caste system. We have Lorenzo played by William L. Johnson, who keeps Michael in his place on this ladder of social status. He has the brain power of a jock in a movie like this, but the tendency towards violence like a gangster in a movie like this. So yeah, loose cannon would be a phrase I would use. You hit no my girl, boy. Nah, it's not like that. T Bone, show him what it's like. Vera Yell plays the love interest, Jada, as well as both the object Michael and Lorenzo want. Not to literally objectify her, but that's how it feels for most of the movie. These two just see Jada as a thing they desire or want to keep a hold of. A MacGuffin, basically. Even Michael, who wants to date her, never says anything about her that he likes or he wants. We're just supposed to assume it's because she has good qualities. Because we never see any of those good qualities in the movie. There will even be a line where Lorenzo calls Michael out for this, saying, You like my girl Jada Michael? She's one hot piece of pussy, is she? Michael hesitates, not because he's appalled by what Lorenzo says, but because he agrees, but doesn't want to say it out loud in this deeply uncomfortable position. Just my idea. Next, we have the members of Lorenzo's crew. Corey Hampton as T-Bone, and Rainy Gulant as Baby Boy. And you can label them both as a crony, as well as an anagram for that word too. Hey yo, cuz, why don't you pass that pussy over here, man? Man, what you know about that? Man, I know more than you, punk. <laughs> They're more of a blind follower than the people genuinely still supporting Colleen Bollinger after that awful video response. These two suck up to Lorenzo and look for his favor, like peasants begging for a meagle ration of food and a famine. And Lorenzo is bad for sure, he sucks. But to follow this guy all your life is even worse. Please, man. <laughs> this punk is crying. Punk ass buster. Next, we have Dee Dee Austin as Monique, Jada's best friend. She comes off as harsh during the beginning parts of the movie, but I think she actually has Michael's best interest at heart. Hi, Monique. Hi, Jada. <laughs> Hi, Michael. What the hell do you want? Monique. No. He'll kill you. I'm not worried about it, so it's cool. Well, you better start worrying about it, punk, unless you want to go home in a body. Monique, chill. We have Lee Marks as Jamal, which is basically just Michael 2.0. He's bigger. Better, stronger, balder, what more could you want? There's Napera Groves, who plays Kahara, who is mostly just here for the vibes. There's also the homeless man, played by Arthur Burghardt, who has a very special job in this story that I won't spoil. And it isn't just watching Michael get stomped out. <laughs> Lastly, we have the main attraction, Angel Vargas, Killjoy himself. And despite the name, a deep feeling of happiness always resurrects when he's on the screen. Who? You need to watch who the fuck hood you creeping up in, cuz. Cuz? Cuz what? <laughs> this dude think he funny. This clown seems to possess reality-bending abilities, great kush, and the ability to create doppelgangers of himself. 
And that's only naming a few of this man's talents. If you guys could help with the power scaling for this man, that'd be great. Because I think he could take some other fellow clowns in a 1v1. Vargas is the best part of the movie, and I'm sure you'll agree. I am your worst nightmare. <laughs> now that you've been given the lowdown on most of the characters, just the bare minimum. I want you to pick your favorite, any one of these folks on the screen. Once you've picked one, remember them. We're going to check in periodically to see if your favorite person has made it through the movie so far, or if they got cut the fuck up. And though the movie has low ratings, I think it's a gem and a half. A cheap looking, cheesy, overly sexualized, over the top, and in all honesty, not good gem, but nonetheless, still a gem. And that's why we're checking it out. All right, we get this very gritty opening with club music straight out of hell. It's giving Neversoft logo on the Tony Hawk games. Also, what a funny game company title. That was until I found out about Hard Again, the number one pill to make your penis pop. It's also giving off a little bit of Silent Hill too. All good scary signs so far. However, that's very different than what we're actually going to be getting into. We transfer over to Michael walking down the street while some banshee sings into the mic. You know you make me smile. <laughs> Interesting opening. Very avant-garde. Oh, yeah, this is Michael. You'll get to know him very soon. What you should know now is that Michael likes this chick. And he shouldn't like this chick because she's bad news. Not really her, but the people she decides or is forced to be with. Either way, Michael should have learned that there are more fish in the sea who aren't friends with sharks and fishermen, especially when Michael is a plankton in this overly complicated analogy. These two ladies begin talking about how this one fell for the oldest trick in the book. The old steal a car, use it to flex, and score a few dates, and maybe make it to third base all before the cops found out about this stolen car. Okay, I was walking home from the grocery store yesterday, right? Hakeem pulls up in a red Mustang convertible and asked me if I needed a ride. Mustang convertible? That's right. <laughs> <laughs> and what happened next? Well, I got in his car. He took me home. Then he dropped me off and asked me for my number. Oh, did you give it to him? What do you think? Hell yeah, I gave that boy my number. <laughs> Sustain. You, you never know when I may need a ride home from school whenever I'm late for the bus. For all she knows, he just spent his tax return just renting it out. He's gonna be using his grandmother's electric scooter for the next couple months as his real form of transportation. Dude, you never know when I may need a ride home from school whenever I'm late for the bus. Michael notices them hanging out in the alleyway and gets ecstatic. Hi, Monique. Hi, Jada. <laughs> Hi, Michael. What the hell do you want? Monique. If you didn't want strange boys talking to you, you shouldn't hang out in alleyways with your friends. That's where all the strange guys find themselves at. Jada doesn't waste time in giving him the warning code Lorenzo has inserted in her programming. It's set off whenever any male, particularly if they're unappealing and not Lorenzo's friends, get into a conversation with her. Look, Michael, if Lorenzo finds out that we've been talking like this, he'll kill you. Speaking of Lorenzo, guess who's in that car? Lorenzo also must have a GPS inside Monique, cause how did he just happen to show up here? That's why they were hiding in the alleyway. They were trying to get away from him. I need to ask you one question, then I'll leave. Okay, what's up? I'd like to know if you go to the homecoming dance with me. No, Michael, stop. Don't be stupid, man. If Lorenzo finds out that we've been talking like this, he'll kill you. You are not listening. Before Michael can make the right choice, Lorenzo shows up. Anything that happens, you had coming, Michael. That's cool. Well, you better start worrying about it, punk, unless you want to go home in a body. Monique, chill. You know the rules. What the fuck is this? You hit no my girl, boy. Nah. Yeah, he was Lorenzo. I saw him. It's not like that. T Bone, show him what it's like. Um, and after this, Michael, uh, Michael gets murdered. I don't know if he deserved all that. Ah! 
Jada eventually tries to help and this guy looks so pissed that he has to pick up Jada and stop her from getting involved. And this stomp out is worse than the one they do in Jojo Part 5. And the worst part about it is that Lorenzo ruins Michael's glasses. Don't get caught slipping, boy. Now Michael can't even see where he went wrong with all this. And this homeless man watches from afar. I don't blame him. I probably wouldn't join in and help either. You didn't give me a dollar. You didn't give me no money. You just gave me a scowl and a middle finger. So Lorenzo leaves with his hostages and we get this office ass zoom. This is a pretty funny opening scene to a horror movie. 